Hi everybody, welcome to Inspirited Live. I'm John Spellman and tonight we're going to be talking about an exciting way to get involved. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will bless us this evening as we study your word. Guide us, we pray, as we go through the study. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Let's start off by looking at uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 to 38, uh, which says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So um, this week's lesson kind of focuses on uh, small groups and how small groups were uh, used in the, uh, in the New Testament start of the early church uh, and how um, they can be effective today as we seek to spread the message of salvation uh, to a world that needs to hear it. Um, so throughout the Bible, small groups are, are highlighted as one of God's methods of strengthening our faith increasing our knowledge of his word, deepening our prayer life, and equipping us to witness. So sometimes it's not always everything done in like big, huge groups of people, but rather um, it can be like small groups of people that come together and decide to get something done. Uh, the Father, the Son, the whole, and the Holy Spirit participated um, in, uh, I guess, what you could call, or what the lesson calls, a small group ministry in that when they created the world, they counseled together and made man in their own image. Um, so so um, you, could, you could argue that, um, or at least the lesson argues that the, that the world was created by a small group uh, that we know of now as the, as the Trinity. Um, Jesus established his small group of disciples and the apostle Paul traveled the Roman world with his small group of evangelistic uh, companions. Um, so we can see applications. Now, obviously, you know, the Bible isn't talking directly about uh, small groups, but you can see applications of it uh, just in different areas. Um, so <clears throat> as, the, as, as the Christian church began to grow in the first century A.D., um, you know, many of the, of the apostles used small groups in order to reach people. Because remember, there weren't but so many of them, and they, and they were spreading to different parts. Um, <clears throat> it's also interesting that after... The church got started, and they and they started to get persecuted in in, in Jerusalem. They then went uh, and formed small groups elsewhere in other parts of the world, and kind of spread out. And that's how Christianity uh, became so widespread across the world. Um, but Jesus, as we know, has had his small group, the uh, the twelve disciples, whom he trained and and prepared for the ministry and and uh, reaching people with the gospel. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter one, verse one to two. Which says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, uh, and the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now I'm going to skip down to verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over, ev and over the cattle, and over, ev and, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that moveth upon the earth. We're also going to take a look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 2. Which says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto, unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to, unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Uh, and next we're going to look at Ephesians 3, verse 8 and 9. Which says, hold on one second, uh, which says, unto me, whom, who, who am less than the least of all saints, is, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which uh, from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, which hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So one of the things that we can see here um, and looking at these different passages that deal with how um, God worked either to create humanity to uh, in the plan of salvation and, and how he spoke to uh, people on earth, we see here that the, that, that the Trinity works in unison. Uh, they work together. They they, func they they are three separate, distinct individuals, but yet they function uh, collectively as if they as as if one. So um, they created man in their own image, and they did that together. Uh, here in Ephesians, where it talks about how um, um, 
God created the world. Remember that that um, the last part of verse nine says, "Which from the beginning of the world have been hidden God." So, you, so we talk about God in the creation, um, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So we see how they were working together. Uh, Jesus was um, carrying out um, what needed to be done. The Father seems to be the the uh, the one who had the plans and the design for everything. Um, so we, we see again how they're working in unison. Um, if we look at Hebrews 1, 2 again, it says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke unto us in times past by the fa- uh, unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So we can see how um, the Father and the Son work together in unison. Uh, and of course, the Holy Spirit supports that and, and um, has always been a part of that. Um, um, uh, the word was in my head and then left. Uh, the Holy Spirit has always been a part uh, of, of working things out uh, according to the divine plan. So the Father, the Son, and the, and the Holy Spirit participated in creation together. Um, they each had different tasks, uh, but yet they functioned as, as uh, one. They were, indivis- they were an indivisible union. The father uh, was the master designer, um, and he carried out his plans through Jesus. Um, and and Jesus is mentioned in Scripture as the active agent in creation, and uh, also in unison with the power of the Holy Spirit. Because in Genesis chapter one, we see how the Spirit of God hovered or or moved upon the face of the waters. Um, So we can see examples of how God used small groups uh, throughout uh, biblical history. It doesn't mean that he's limited to that. It just means that that's just uh, something that we see consistently, how uh, small groups were used to do things. John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. Let's take a look at that next. Therefore, doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man, hath, uh, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This, is the com- this commandment have I received of my father. Um, now let's take a look at Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Which says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also make alive or quicken your mortal bodies uh, by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 15, which says, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because if we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. So from these three passages, we can see that the Father gave the command, the Spirit supplies the power to do it, and Jesus follows through and carries out the actual action. So all three were present and and at work uh, with regard to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Father is the one who gave the command. uh, The Spirit is the one who supplied the power. Jesus, of course, carried it out and and and, 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 and raised up. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are united um even in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The plan of salvation had its place in the councils of, of, of the infinite from all eternity. Uh, so what's interesting about it is that uh, the plan of salvation existed long before humanity had ever sinned. That's why Jesus was called the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, um, because the plan of salvation uh, was in place so that if man should sin, um, that, that there was a plan in place to, to redeem. And so the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost agreed and and came together to make that plan and that Jesus would be the one to carry it out. He would be the the one to sacrifice. Um, And remember that John 3.16 tells us that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. So Jesus was sent. Uh, So God, God, and and even here in, in, um, I think it's in, um, oh, in John 10, uh, Jesus says that he this commandment has he received of the Father. So it's the Father who gives the command, who, who, who does the sending. Jesus carries it out, and of course the Holy Spirit supplies the power. Now, of course, in um, 
creation, uh, Jesus himself has his has his own power. So we don't know like all the ins and outs of uh, of you know who did exactly what. And you know, uh, for example, we have Job, which tells us that the spirit of God garnished the heavens. Um, so we don't know everything about who did what in uh, the work of creation entirely like you know in, in, like as far as um what things the holy spirit did what things only jesus did that sort of thing but we know that all three were present all three took action all three worked it out and that mankind is made in, in the image of all three um <clears throat> in the work of uh the resurrection we see that all three um take a take a take a a, a specific role as well um, and while Jesus was on, uh, was doing his ministry on earth, remember that he didn't use his own power to do his miracles. He used the same power that's available to all of us. So uh, the Holy Spirit, again, supplied the power throughout his ministry. Um, it was not uh, Jesus himself that did the, the recorded miracles. He used the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why he could say, it's not me that's doing the works, but the, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He was talking specifically about the Holy Spirit who was dwelling in him and doing the work. So, in focusing on this idea of small groups, small groups have have multiple purposes to focus on winning the lost people, winning lost people to Jesus. Uh, so the purpose of them is to reach people. Um, the ultimate goal of, of, of our small groups uh, should be soul winning. So when we form small groups, we too should have the purpose of, of, of reaching people. I'm also thinking of the small group uh, that started in Babylon with uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and, and, and Daniel. Uh, through their small group ministry, they were able to reach the Babylonians, uh, particularly the king of, of Babylon, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, so their, their prayer ministry led to um, not just the revealing of, of a prophetic message, but also uh, a change in the heart of the king. And of course, uh, sharing the gospel, sharing uh, you know what they knew of as, as, as far as the gospel is concerned um, to the world of that time. So small groups can provide people with opportunity for, for the Lord to uh, to use each of us more fully. Because when you're in a larger context of a much larger church, sometimes it's hard for people to get a chance to use their skills and use their abilities. Um, but when you're in a smaller group or even a smaller church, then obviously there's more of a need for your skill set. Because, you know, if you already have a person that does, let's say, like communications, you don't necessarily need 10 people doing communications. So, you know, if you're in a, a church where they are, there's already a strong communication department, they don't really need another person doing communications. Um, so they don't really, unless, you know, aside from like taking turns, maybe. Um, so sometimes people with that skill set might be better used in a different setting, in a different church, um, because they, you know, have more opportunity there. There's more, there's more room for them to, to exercise or use that skill. So if you ever find that you're in a church where you're not, um, where you feel like you're not getting a chance to do much, uh, then chances are it could just be because, you know, you, um, the church is so large and has so many people doing so many different things that maybe they might not have use for the thing that you want to do or that you want to provide. But other churches that are smaller might have use for that because, you know, they, they might not have the personnel to be able to do it. Uh, so something to consider, like small groups do give people opportunities uh, to do more things because there's more of a need for that skill set. So that's that's one of the positive things about it. Um, <clears throat> small groups also help people to kind of cultivate their talents or their gifts as well. So uh, sometimes you get people who um, maybe they want to do something, but they just have no idea. They've never gotten gotten the training. And uh, a lot of times it's not necessarily the fault of the church per se. It's 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 just what happens because you're focusing on so many different people at one time that it's hard to recognize or, or to, or to rec see the talents in other people uh, when you have such a large group. Uh, so smaller groups allow individualized attention. And with the individualized attention, your, your skills and your, your um, abilities can be developed because they're more likely to be recognized. So, you know, you don't want to take it personal. Like some people, like they may be in a church setting and they take it personal. They feel like, oh, the church doesn't need me. The church doesn't care about me. It's not that. Uh, it may just be that they don't uh, get a chance to recognize what you come to the table with or, or what you would like to see developed in yourself because there's so many people there. It's hard to focus on everybody or recognize the talents or potential within every person uh, when you don't have time to spend with every single person, you know, uh, individually. Um, so, you know, if you're in a larger group setting, sometimes you have to open up your mouth and say something and say, hey, you know, I'd like to try this or how do I go about um, learning how to do such and such a ministry. Because if you never say anything, then they never know, oh, wait, this person has an interest in that. So you don't want to be put off by not 
you know, having certain talents or abilities recognized at first, sometimes you got to put yourself out there and ask for training, ask for, um, you know, uh, development in a particular area. And um, your church should be, you know, pleased to, to give you some training in that area. Um, but then, you know, going back to what we were talking about with regard to small groups, sometimes, you know, small groups make it a lot easier because there's a greater need uh, to develop talents in different areas. And sometimes when there's no need, um, they don't always get sought out. They don't always get developed uh, because there's not a need for it right away. So, so it kind of slips people's minds. But when there's a need for something, then it's like, OK, we have to get this done. Who can we get to do it? Uh, so you're more likely to find your talents used. Let's go to Exodus chapter 18, verse 21 to 25. <clears throat> Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds and rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they shall judge. So, so shall it be easier for yourself, and, and they shall bear the burden with you. If you shall do this thing, and God command you so, then you shall be able to endure, and all this people shall also go to their, to their place in peace. So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law, and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of, the, out of all Israel, and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens. So basically... Um, Moses was told here to delegate responsibility to others in order not to burn himself out trying to do everything himself. Uh, and so there were small groups formed. Uh, so, uh, you know, first you had large groups, or, so people who were leading large, larger groups, but then you had within that larger group, a smaller group, within that smaller group, another smaller group, all the way down to groups of tens. Uh, just to give you some context behind why this was done, Moses pretty much was the person who talked with God, uh, you know, face to face, mouth to mouth, even apparently. Uh, and so God uh, communicated his will to Israel directly through Moses. Uh, and whenever people had a problem or an issue that could be a violation of God's law, they would bring the issue to Moses and they would say, okay, Moses, this is what's going on. What do we do about this? How do we handle this situation? But you can imagine that when you're one person trying to deal with a country of people that all have these different problems and issues, it can be a bit of a burnout when you're the only one who's trying to solve everybody's problems. So Moses basically was tiring himself out and he was getting stressed out. Uh, at one point, um, I'm not sure if it's before or after this, but he says to God, uh, you know, did I give birth to all these people that I'm the one who has to bring them all out? Uh, you know, if this is the way that you're treating me, kill me. Uh, and that, you know, that's, that's what he said really out of frustration because um, the, the challenges uh, challenges that, the, that he constantly had to deal with regarding the people. Now, um, it's interesting that, you know, I believe God inspired Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, um, to give him this counsel because Moses was starting to burn himself out, um, you know, trying to handle all these things himself. And, you know, it wasn't God's will that he do that anyway. Let me just go ahead and grab the text for you. Hold on one second. Yeah, so uh, the passage I was referring to is in Numbers chapter 11, uh, particularly in verse 15, uh, where God tells Moses... Uh, and then eventually God tells Moses, hey, you know, get, uh, get, get gather together 70 men of the elders of Israel, uh, whom, whom you know to be uh, the elders of the people and officers over them and bring them uh, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And then afterwards, Moses, uh, God takes of the spirit that's upon Moses and puts it on, um, uh, you know, these, these elders to help him bear the burden and so that he wouldn't have to do it himself alone. Um, so the point here, the context was really that Moses was trying to do everything himself. He was pretty much like a one man show and it just wasn't effective because it was starting to tire him out. So he, the reality is that he needed help and God um, would, would put, take of, of the Holy Spirit that was within Moses and, uh, and, and, and allow the spirit to work with other individuals who could deal with lesser matters. But the greatest matters were brought to Moses since he was the closest to God. So basically from this experience, Moses has to delegate responsibilities to others so as not to burn himself out. Uh, so small groups were an effective way of doing that so that they could, um, you know, um, get things done more efficiently and deal with, uh, you know, with, with relatively small problems easier and then allow Moses to get to the bigger issues relatively quickly. So every individual in the camp of Israel um, became part of a, a group of 10 uh, led by a godly official. 
And then, of course, they had larger groups for the hundreds and for the, um, for the thousands and so forth. And this was a place where problems could get solved, uh, where they could fellowship, where problems were, could be prevented, and, 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 and also people could be spiritually nurtured. In our small groups today, we have a common goal uh, like this as well. Uh, we want problems to be solved. Uh, we want um, fellowship to take place. Um, people get a chance to, 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 um, to really um, get a better understanding of the vision of the church. Um, people can form tight and caring relationships. And it's an opportunity uh, where people uh, can, can help and get more involved in the work that's, that needs to be done. And find ways to solve you know, whatever problems might be preventing that work from getting done. Uh, when people struggle with things, they can find help uh, you know, with what they're struggling with. Small groups provide opportunities for warm, caring fellowship, uh, spiritual growth, and, and problem solving of, of many different kinds. Now, a small group of specialists suggests that the ideal size for a small group would be between 6 and 12 people. And it's interesting that this is the exact size that both Moses and Jesus employed uh, in forming their group. So, Jesus, uh, so Moses, of course, had his, had his groups of tens. Jesus had his 12 disciples. So we can see that that's typically how those groups worked. Uh, meaning like regarding those numbers. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. The Bible says, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into, the, into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And when he called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And let's go now to Mark uh, chapter 3, verse 13 to 15. And he goeth up into a mountain and call, and call unto, unto, unto him whom he would, and they came unto him, and he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that they might send them uh, and that he might send them forth uh, to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. So here again, you see how uh, Jesus worked with this group of 12 to train them to do the very work that he wanted them to do. And through, the, through those 12, you know, the, that's how the church got started. And then eventually the ministry of uh, the Apostle Paul. So Jesus personally trained this group uh, and got them prepared. And then they were ready to carry on his work. He prepared them both spiritually and practically for their for their mission to the world. So he gave them like practical experience, going out, casting out devils. I mean, you know, you can imagine that uh, initially the, the 12 made a lot of mistakes. Uh, there were times when they didn't get the job done. And when Jesus had to show them, okay, this is how you do it. Like I'm thinking particularly about the time when they attempted to cast out a demon. It didn't happen. And then Jesus explained that this kind comes out uh, through nothing except fasting and prayer. Um, so we see that uh, Jesus empowered them, but he also... Uh, took time to teach them. He, he took time to really prepare them for the ministry that he had called them to. So through fellowship with Jesus, they grew in, the, in, in grace and they learned how to extend that grace to other people. They learned how to minister to other people more effectively to be, I mean, because you, you're talking about a group of people that went from, if the Samaritans don't, don't let us in and, and they speak harshly toward us, then we should call down fire from heaven and destroy them to people who are now starting churches in Samaria. It's a big night and day difference uh, when we look at how uh, Jesus empowered them and, and how he taught them and prepared them to reach people. Jesus taught them about like how looking at, at the field, meaning the world, uh, as, a, as, a, as a ripening harvest, uh, seeing the potential rather than being so quick to condemn and to, and to, and to judge through human eyes. Um, they learned through observation of what Jesus did, how to use their gifts. So the purpose of Jesus' small groups was both spiritual was to both spiritually nurture and also uh, to prepare them for outreach. So it wasn't just like keeping it a small group, but rather extending it uh, and 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 welcoming more and more people in. Let's look at First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse twelve to twenty-five. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit. Are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit? For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? 
if it uh if the ear shall say because i am not the eye um i am not of the body is it therefore not of the body if uh, the whole body were an eye where were the hearing if the whole were hearing where were the smelling but now god hath uh, set the members every one of them in the body as it hath pleased him and if they are and if they were all one member where were the body but now are they many members yet but one body and the eye cannot say unto the hand i have no need of you nor again the head to the feet i have no need of you nay or no much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon these we bestow more abundant honor and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness for our comely parts have no need but god hath tempered the body together having given more abundant honor to the part which which lacked that there should be no schism in the body but that the members should have the same care one for another so the human body has many parts but yet it works together as a single entity to do a lot of complex functions the church can can have many groups uh but working together to serve the purposes of the church uh and each one you know maybe set maybe does something distinct uh but yet it it, it functions as a whole um or so rather it contributes to the whole in that it all it, it all works for the same purpose of edifying and building up the body of christ um, and then we also got to have to consider with Paul's analogy, you can look at like, for example, that each person, uh, represents maybe perhaps one aspect of the body, but yet you have different, uh, parts of the body that function together in small groups that perform certain functions for the entire body. So for example, you have the finger, right? But yet you have five fingers, uh, and those five fingers come together and form the hand. Uh, and so the hand for, uh, is a small group within the within the human body that that uh, does and completes complex functions, and it works with other small groups of the body in order to carry out important functions. Uh, so that's one, another way of looking at it. So the church serves uh, serves the purpose of nurturing and building people up. Uh, and within the church, you have individual members, which which form which uh, which do different functions and use their spiritual gifts to accomplish great things. And then, of course, you have within the church groups, small groups of in of individuals that perform certain functions for the church. Just as the hand, the foot, the legs, the arm are groups that serve the body, the human body. So uh, Mark Finley points out that a study of anatomy and physiology reveals that organs of the of the body are organized into different interrelated systems for example the digestive cardiovascular respiratory the skeletal are just a few of the body's complex organ systems spiritual gifts are like the different parts of the body uh, and they function best when organized into systems or groups in fact in most cases they cannot function alone our bodies are not just a, a, a lump of separate organs freelancing away at whatever they do each bodily function is organized into tightly knit into a tightly knit system that works together toward a common goal. So whether we're individuals doing a work for the Lord or whether we're a part of a small group, we're all working to build up and to edify the body. Everybody can't be doing their own thing and, and, and uh, doing something contrary. It all functions together uh, to, to accomplish the tasks that are required by the body. Just, and so it is in, 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 uh, in Christ, where uh, whether we're working with our ministry individually doing something or whether we're part of a small group doing something, the purpose is to edify the body of Christ, edify the church, and to build it up. So um, we can be, and, and small groups allow us to do that effectively. <clears throat> when we are part of a small group of people with uh, similar interests go and goals, we find that our efforts can can be much uh, better focused and greatly and greatly magnified. Jesus's ministry sowed the seed of the of the gospel. And prepare the multitudes to accept the preaching of, of the disciples so remember that like jesus went into places like samaria and other places and not you know some of them um you know learned a lot from him uh but we don't see a lot of them getting baptized right away however after jesus ascended up into heaven and ended up um you know uh sending his disciples to, to some of the same places uh where he went while he was alive here on the earth um the disciples ended up reaching people and starting churches in many of those areas. Samaria would be a, a prime example. But, uh, so Jesus's ministry and his work um, during his earthly ministry uh, resulted in churches getting started after his ascension into heaven 
and his and his disciples carrying on his work. So it's interesting what Jesus started, uh, you know, himself grew into something much larger uh, by the time his disciples were ready to uh, to lead. And even when we look at how the disciples went from place to place starting churches, you know, usually it was like two of them at a time or, you know, two in different places going from place to place in small groups, but yet planting churches there and, and, and uh, allowing people to grow in their faith. And then they would move to another place once a church had been established. So that was the work that they did as apostles. One of the contributing factors of rapid growth in the New Testament church was its small group organization and structure. Small groups made a huge difference in starting the early church. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 18, verse 1 to 5. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in, uh, born in Pontus, lately uh, come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was uh, of the same craft, he abode with them and, and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and, Tim and Timotheus uh, were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Next, we're going to go to Acts chapter 20, verse 1 to 4. The Bible says, And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for, for to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he, be, he came into Greece. And there he abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him as he was about to sail in, into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. And there accompanied him into Asia, uh, uh, Sapater, of uh, Berea and of, uh, and of the Thessalonians, um, Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius of, of Derby, and Timotheus and Asia, uh, Tychicus and uh, uh, Trophim Trophimus. These going before carried for, for us at Troas. So um, notice here that Luke includes the names of some of the individuals that traveled with Paul and helped him to start these churches. So Paul didn't just do this stuff by himself. It doesn't just go, uh, give a general statement and say, oh, yeah, Paul took a couple people with him and started churches in, 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 uh, in these locations. It actually mentions some of these individuals by name. Uh, so, so a lot of the people that Paul had previously worked with uh, in certain areas became church leaders and helped him and worked with him to start new churches in new territories. So uh, Luke actually makes it a point in the book of Acts to mention these people by name because others who were reading the story or who were reading this account uh, would have would have been familiar with these individuals. Um, so it shows us that they that they mutually supported one another in their outreach ministry. Um, and the number of names here mentions men, mentioned was was small, which which helps to show uh, that, you know, they, they began these churches with small numbers and allowed them to grow. Each one of these people had had different gifts. Uh, they came from different backgrounds, different cultures. Um, they had different ways of looking at, at things and, were, and did not always see everything exactly the same. But each one had a valuable contribution to make in the cause of Christ. And that's what made their ministry so effective. Even though they were different, they were working for a common purpose. And um, they, they tended to balance each other out and accomplish the goal uh, for which they were come together. So the, their diversities of gifts, backgrounds, and experiences contributed to the growth of the church. It was not a hindrance to it. Let's take a look at um, Acts chapter 16, uh, verse 11 to 15. The Bible says, Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to uh, Samothracia, and the next day to ne Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of the part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days, and on the Sabbath we went out of the city by, by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and, sp and spoke unto the women which resorted there. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Tyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord had opened, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of by, which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized, 
and her and her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And it came to pass as we went uh, to prayer, a certain damsel... Well, actually, I'll, I'll stop at uh, verse 15. I'm not going to read uh, verse 16. That's another part of the story. Uh, but I'll actually go down to um, verse 40. And uh, they went out of, of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, uh, they comforted them and, and departed. Next, I'm going to go to Acts chapter 12, verse 11 and 12. Which says... And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I, ha I know of a certainty, sorry, of a surety, uh, that the Lord has sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So in these two passages that we read from Acts chapter 16 and also Acts chapter 12, we see that... Um, Immediately after Lydia's conversion, uh, Paul and his and his people stayed with Lydia, uh, and we see even that Peter, when he was released from when he when the angel released him from prison, um, he went to the home of, of Mary, who was John Mark's mother. So the New Testament believers regularly met in people's homes. Christian homes became centers of influence and the heart of a small group ministry. Uh, so we can see here that, you know, with a small group that they started, just, you know, reaching a person like Lydia, uh, now after release from prison, Paul had a place to go uh, and where he could be, uh, where he could be ministered unto. Uh, Peter had a place to go. You know, he went to the home of Mary, uh, the, the mother of John Mark, after he, after he was um, set free by the angel, uh, you know, sent, sentenced to death. Uh, you know, he, he had escaped from prison. So small groups can often be safe havens for people uh, where they can, you know, um, they can be, they have a place to talk, they, they have a place to uh, communicate some issues, they have a place to be uh, ministered to or, or to get some direction, some, some, some counsel. Um, they're places for people to express their problems and to discuss mutual concerns. They provide communi uh, communities of support, uh, opportunities for spiritual growth, um, and caring relationships where people can grow both spiritually and, um, you know, just individually as people. But of course, the emphasis the emphasis would be on on spiritual growth. So these these groups have a have a purpose. It's not just meeting to go bowling and having a good time. Uh, the purpose is to grow spiritually and to reach uh, people for the kingdom. Uh, so it's not really a, a a small group if it's just meeting for the purpose of socializing. Let's take a look at um, Acts chapter four verse thirty one. The Bible says, <clears throat> "And when they had prayed, the place was shaken." where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke the, wor the word of God with boldness. Next, we're going to go to Acts chapter 12 and verse 12. The Bible says, and when, they, and when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where, uh, where many were gathered together praying. Let's now go to Acts chapter 20. Notice the common theme here. Acts chapter 20, uh, verse 17 to 19. And from uh, Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first, from the first day that I came to, into Asia after what manner I had been with, with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with uh, many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and I and how I kept nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go down to verse 27 to 32. Same chapter. For I have not shunned to, de to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. 
Therefore, watch and remember that, uh, that by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have, con uh, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or, or apparel. Yea, you, you yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my, ne uh, unto my necessities and to them that were with me. So one of the things that we can see about small groups from this passage is that they prayed together. So often there were communities that met together in small groups to pray together, to pray about uh, different challenges that they were facing and to petition God. Um, in these small groups, they also were, uh, learned things. They were taught things. Um, they, get, they got advice or counsel. Uh, and, and also we see that there was supposed to be shepherding that takes place. So you had this group of elders and their job was to shepherd and to protect the flock of God because there were false teachers and false prophets and, peop and grievous things that were going to arise after and, 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 try and attempt to come into the church. So they would intercede for others, pray about mutual concerns, share in warm fellowship, study the word of God. That's very important. They were, they were equipping each other for service, uh, help, helping to protect each other against false teachers and false prophets. And they participated in, in, um, in, in doing outreach activities together. So you can see the, the nature of the small group and what they accomplished. So small groups made a difference. And through focusing, uh, and, and through focusing on, 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 um, on their mission and through the power of the Holy Spirit that worked through, in and through them, uh, they were effective in their outreach. Let's go to Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38. The Bible said, then, then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the uh, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into the into his harvest. And in that passage encapsulates basically the one of the modern problems of the church. There's a whole lot of work to be done, but few people that want to do it. Um so it's just this thing where people who are willing to do the work are usually few in number. Uh, and we need to pray for God to send more laborers because sometimes maybe we might, we might not be as effective in accomplishing a, a, a certain work, but somebody else might have a talent or a gift given to them by God that just enables them to reach people that you just can't reach. So there's always a need uh, for more laborers um, and, and to accomplish uh, you know, the work that God has given us to do. Uh, Jesus said himself that the harvest truly was plentiful. There's a lot to be done. There's a lot of good things that can result. But the problem is the laborers are few. So Christ's resolution uh, was not to give up, but to pray that the Lord of the harvest, in other words, to pray to God that he would send more laborers into his harvest, into the work of the gospel. So small groups are an answer to Christ's prayer um, and exponentially increase the number of laborers for Christ's harvest because we're developing new people that have leadership qualities. And capabilities and that know how to use their gifts and their abilities to, to be of service so small groups help with that and building people up so that they too can become ministers i think uh some part of the problem though is that you get a lot of people who don't really want to actually do anything and are comfortable not being equipped so that they can say okay well hey i don't know if i can ever do something like that but the idea behind small groups is to train people uh because you know a lot of times people have this like bench mentality when it comes to church where Everybody kind of sits on the sidelines and they criticize the leaders and they think that the leaders are supposed to be doing everything. But the reality is that that's not really what the New Testament shows us. Every me We're supposed to have total member involvement. Everybody, when you become a Christian, you become involved in ministry. Now, everybody's ministry might be different, but everybody needs to be involved in ministry. And, and um, in order to uh, deal with the issue of people feeling like they're not equipped or not ready or that they don't know the Bible as well, Small groups help with that in that it helps you to train, just like how Jesus trained his disciples. It helps you to train and equip people for doing ministry. Um, you might not ever preach a sermon. You might not necessarily give um, maybe a, 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 um, a Bible study directly, uh, but there's so many other things that you can be involved in. Uh, you know, you could share uh, different things. You can contribute to the Bible study. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that you can uh, that you can do even if your ministry is not necessarily teaching per se so the, the focus of all effective small groups is witness and service so we want to train people so that they can reach others they can share with people on their jobs they can share with people in their communities we want people to share with one another 
Uh, and, and in doing so, uh, a lot of people will be reached that you never thought that you, that you would have been able to reach. Okay, so uh, that's all that we uh, have for this week. Um, let's uh, close with a word of prayer that God will help us to be more effective in reaching people and in, in training uh, individuals so that we can be effective workers for him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing in uh, coming together to uh, study your word. Help us, Father, to be more effective at uh, in-reach and outreach. Help us, Lord, to nurture one another so that we can grow the church and, and increase people's uh, abilities and, and, and give them training, Lord, in the areas where they need it so that they can be more effective workers for you. And we also pray that you would guide us and bless us in our outreach so that we can touch lives and, and draw souls to your and, and, and reach them, Lord, for your kingdom. We pray, Lord, that you would send more laborers into your harvest so that we can do an effective work for you. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming, everyone. Have a great week.